Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Tonight we do have a good speaker. I think she's good. She's good a lot in the last two or three years. It's like the last two or three months she's good a lot. And she don't. And I've been doing Sue for quite some time. She's meant a lot to me. She's taught me a lot. She learned she had a lot before she ever came into this program of Alcoholic Anonymous. She had already found something that so many of us don't find at the time that we've been in. I'm not going to try to tell her a story. Some of you have heard her before. I always enjoy hearing her. This time I'll give you Sue. And I'm scared. <laughs> I don't know what it is. You fellas, I'm more scared than I was at my first, I think the first time I talked. You're just so dear to me, I guess. It uh, means a lot to be back here and have a chance. And, and the ones from the, the outside, there are two or three I know that God love them. <laughs> They're precious to me because they really... Build my ego up. Uh, helps me one day at a time. I said I am an alcoholic. I'm so grateful to be here tonight. Grateful to be alive tonight. I think I was AA aware all my life. That is, I was anxious and afraid. I was anxious for tomorrow and afraid of yesterday. By the grace of God, this program and the people wherever I go that are participating and in that order, I'm working on trying to learn to live one day at a time. And that's not always easy. I still get into another into that other class of AA occasionally. I uh I take this program seriously. I speak seriously about it. I always admire these uh, speakers that can get up and, you know, the jokes just seem to come real easily. They don't with me. I enjoy them thoroughly, but um, I guess I get on the serious side too much. Sometimes maybe I get on the spiritual, and I don't say spiritual part. I say spiritual because I don't think there is a part to it. It's a whole. For without it, I don't think that the program would be very successful. I think it is a spiritual program. And I did find a God of my understanding. And it was sometime after I came into the program that all of a sudden I realized that it was as we say a God of our understanding because I was reared uh, as a Christian as we say in a Christian home I attended church Sunday school I took my children to Sunday school and church and all of those things so I thought that I knew God not really well, you see, I didn't know myself. And when I finally cried out, God, help me. For I can no longer do for myself. That is when I found the God that we speak of in this program. A God that I can talk with each day as I talk with you. Not one that I just repeat a prayer and hope that it gets above the ceiling. I try to let him walk with me at all times or ride with me wherever. For I am here tonight only by the grace and love of him. You know, this is a program of love. 
I had to learn to love myself first before I could learn to love you. And it feels so good to stand here and see all of you looking at me and I know that you love me. It really helps. If you're here tonight for the first time or here tonight for any time, I hope that I may say something that will help help you. But most of all, it's helping me. And thank you for being here to share with me, to help me one more day at a time. I talked in Chattanooga about a month or so ago, and that night I talked more on a drunkalogue because I had begun to realize I was forgetting, getting away from a lot of things that I need to remember, not dwell on, but I need to remember. I need to remember the remorse, guilt, and the heartache. But most of all, I need to remember that throughout all of those times and all of these human hurts that we inflict as practicing alcoholics, there was love. There was love in the face, faces of my children, my mother, my friends. And again, see, it goes back to love. Just one little word. But it means a lot to us as human beings. Uh, I drank very early in life at an age which now I consider almost barely out of the crib at that time I thought I was old enough to vote I was 13 that's pretty young I didn't go with a drinking crowd all the time but the night that I did take my first drink I was with an older crowd and they did drink so it made me feel real big real important to be right in the middle of them but you know I didn't feel very big and very important the next morning I was really almost ready to act like the baby that I was go home and cry to mama because I didn't go home that night. I spent the night with a girlfriend. I'm pretty sure her mother knew what I'd done because if I remember correctly, I sent her to the kitchen three times to get me a glass of water. The third time she said, I can't go anymore. My mother's going to know something's wrong. You see, I didn't know this was part of the after effect of alcohol. Part of that beginning to build a foundation that had nothing to stand on because it was built on nothing solid. And other things that helped build that was just what I mentioned earlier. The guilt feelings, the remorse, all of the things that went in with drinking, shame, I didn't drink much for many years. I married young. And uh, we did do our party drinking, which was usually on just on the weekends. But you know, even at that early stage, and I was to progress much, much more, I do learn it is progressive, even at that early stage, I never wanted just one drink. I always had to keep on until I got drunk. And pretty soon, 
um, after I did progress a little bit more, by, by now I had one and two children. I was looking forward more uh, to drink as an escape. And I do realize that's the reason I drank mostly until I became became so obsessed it ruled me I didn't rule it but I look forward more to escaping the uh, living problems the tension that would build up within me because I think any of you in this room that are alcoholics you realize that first drink a lot of times takes a, t- a lot of tension And that first drink is the one that causes all the trouble. So pretty soon I was uh, maybe drinking some during the week. Not excessively. But it was increasing. And it was creating problems already. My children, my my oldest child is a girl. By now she's in school. And she would realize when mother was drinking. And I think she got so... She was hesitant about bringing her friends home from school with her. Because she was ashamed if she brought them home. She didn't want her friends to see her mother like that. So... As the years went along, and by now we have three children. By now the the marriage is not doing so well. By now a lot of resentments have been built. A lot of hurt has been inflicted. A lot of things said and a lot of things done that only what we could say is the grace of God makes it humanly possible to begin to want to forgive. By now, the stage is set in my life for a full-size drama of pretense. Pretending to be happy, laughing on the outside and crying on the inside. And this went on for about 20 years. I well remember one night we had been to a party. And as usual, I had to be carried home. I think at this stage I probably had blackouts, and I didn't know then what a blackout is. But I think now that that night I did have a blackout. And I remember my mother-in-law and she hated drinking with a passion. Was standing, she had been keeping the children that night. And she was standing by my bedside. And I must have come out, I had to, I came out of that fog somewhat and I heard her saying, I would like to slap her. And that built resentment in me. For you see, I knew that I had hurt her, even as drunk as I was. But still, I resented her feeling that way towards me. She had no right. She had every right in the world. But neither she nor I realized at that time I was a sick person. This is a sickness. Also, I think that I belong to Al-Anon because I've had to learn to live with myself. And that's been very hard. That's part of what I have to work on one day at a time. So these little things keep happening and finally we decide to uh, divorce and separate. And for the next two years, I've drunk 24 hours a day. 
I wallowed in self-pity. I no longer cared who I hurt, how I hurt, or to what degree it went. I was committing a slow suicide. Now these two years are hard years to remember. And there are still things that come back to me that I keep shoving back in my mind. And I think that God in His mercy has kept a lot of it from my mind until He sees fit that maybe I have grown enough in strength and wisdom to be able to cope with it. To be able to try and accept it. To be able and willing to make amends if possible. If not possible, to accept the fact that I would if I could, but cannot, and live with it. You know, I think this is one part of the, the program and this way of life that we have learned to try and live with that makes it so beautiful. For I feel that each one of you here in this room, could you know some of the deep heartaches that were inflicted by me? And still sit there and love and accept me for what I am trying to become. You understand. That's a big secret to the way it works. Understanding. For you see a lot of these people that have not suffered in the way that we have in this room. I'm sure they look at me and wonder how I can even walk down the street and hold up my head. But that's what love, the kind of love that we come to know in this program, makes it so beautiful. For you see, those three children, I hurt them (coughs) as deeply as they could be hurt. But one day at a time, for almost three years now, I have slowly regained their love and respect. So I spent two years of slow suicide. I drank alone a lot. I cried alone a lot. And I was in and out of hospitals. My youngest son sat with me one night when I was in the hospital in DTs. And I well remember when I came out of it just clear enough to realize that he was there. And I was trying to get out of the bed. And he said, Mama, if you come out of that bed, I'll hit you. He thought he'd know what that would be like, don't you? To maybe have to say something like that to the dearest person in the world to you. But yet you know it would be for her own good. But that little fella calls me and he comes to see me and I thank God for it that's part of the heartache I inflicted (coughs) and that last time that I was in the hospital and a little girl seemed like young people were involved in my drunk log so much. That's irony, I guess, because 
young people mean so much to me and they did so much for me they were the ones that I guess subconsciously I held on to because it was a young girl that stood beside my bed and she said Sue please quit drinking and I was just coming out of the throes of DT the hell the living hell of alcoholism and somehow I had enough sense a little bit of sanity left enough to say yes I would come to Moccasin Bend and seek help at that time I don't think I was capable of deciding if I wanted to come to not drink to drink or what I only knew that I had nothing left except the grave or a mental institution to turn to and I was darn close to the grave so when I came to Moccasin Bend as I said I don't think I was capable of really thinking but somehow during the first week or so that I was there there were no blinding lights no clap of thunder it was just there the serenity and peace that comes from deep down within a human's heart when she says God help me I can't help myself. Don't know what I'm going to do. What is there to do? And with that peace and serenity that filled my heart, the desire to drink was gone. He removed it. And I have learned for myself that if I drink today, it will be because I want to. I do not desire to. And when I came out of there, I had life. I was living. I was no longer a robot. I was no longer obsessed with alcohol. That it was number one in my life. And I didn't go back where I had been. I stayed and I found new playmates. I found a new way to start working, trying to live. I say this in nearly every talk I make. And I hope as long as I live, as long as I stay in the program, that I still say it. Do you know, after I got a job and I was walking to work, this is simple, but this is a simple program. It's a simple life. Can you imagine a 37, 38 year old woman, grandmother, walking down the street for the first time? looking up at the blue of the sky seeing it looking at the green leaves looking at a flower blooming <clears throat> it had color and it had purpose it was God given and it was beautiful and I know that during that period of time that sometimes God wished that he just left me alone or I'd left him alone because I'm sure I worried him to death but all I did was talk to him because you see I hadn't found this program I hadn't found you people 
It was all I had. And I kept saying, God, help me find a way to show what you have done for my life. A seemingly hopeless alcoholic that at one time couldn't get up in the morning and even hold a drink in her hand to get it down. That if anybody was around, I'd have to get them to hold it for me. But you see, with God, nothing is hopeless. And He sustained me for some six months. He guided me to this program. To you people. And when I walked in and you looked at me and you said, Welcome. I love you in spite of what you are or what you've done. But most of all, I understand. And that's what I've been searching for all my life. Love and understanding. And I've been running away from it. You people gave me steps. You told me I had to do nothing. And that was very good for me. Because I'm a very stubborn person. I can be led to do many things, made to do very few. And these steps are beautiful. They are the stepping stones upon which we build this foundation, this way of life. And you know something else that I've come to realize since I've been in this program? Something that I took for granted so much. Time. Time is God-given. When we give of ourselves, that's the most precious thing that we can give. Because nobody else can do that for us. There are many things that I have become aware of since I've been in this program. By no means do I stand up here tonight and tell you I practice 24 hours a day all that I'm aware of because I am not humanly capable of it. I have my weaknesses. But thank God that I want to work on them. It keeps me busy. It keeps me from stagnating. Nor do I work on them all the time like I should. But it's great to try. These past three years have been beautiful. Not always easy. I think that's where I made one mistake years ago. I thought that life would be a bed of roses once you found God. Once you found something to hang on to, a higher power greater than yourself, there are some who do not choose to call it God, whatever the higher power you choose. But I thought once you found that, it would be a bed of roses. This is not the way life goes. We must come to accept the good and the bad together. For me... I have found that for the bad times, if I can learn to accept them and not want to drink and just hang in there, there will be a better time. But I alone control that. I have to let go and let God. I have to accept.
pitch you fellas wish I'd shut up so you could have some refreshments and that I'm going to do. But first I want to thank you very, very much for being here tonight to share with me, to listen to me. It's helped me. For you see, fellas, whenever I'm in an AA group and with people that I love and know love me, I'm exactly where I want to be, doing exactly what I want to do. And I know I've come home. Thank you. Questions. <laughs> you didn't say anything bad. I didn't know if you were going to have it tonight. No, we, we have it. We have it. Okay. It's traditional here. Okay. <coughs> Y'all already asked my age, so it's, you know. <laughs> well, we had to squeeze that out of the last <laughs> It was hard to be honest that night, too. <laughs> now, you just told us that Jack Benny, you know, did tell us the right age. Yeah. This may be even at that time irrelevant, but I hear so many people getting getting uh, you know arrested for DUI, and I used to be in the hole on the street that never got stopped for DUI. Uh-huh. I was just don't know if you ever got stopped for that. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did, and uh, I well remember one night I said uh, he asked me how how many, and I had the proverbial two. You know, <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> what, uh, what, what step have you done actually that's good for you besides step one? Randy, that's a hard question. Uh, I would have to, I believe at this this point, Maintaining a conscious contact with God is, I would say, my mainstay. Because, Randy, if I lose that, uh, I really get out of control. And it makes it hard to even work the other steps for me. How long have I been in AA? Uh, it, I will have my one day at a time, third birthday in November. November 27th. We're going to be having another birthday party in you, 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 you will be coming to our. Good Lord willing, and the creeks don't rise. <laughs> and the job doesn't interfere. <laughs> That's the biggest problem. God love you. Had I not come into AA, honey, I wouldn't have them today. Yes. Yes. My mother loves me today. At one time, my mother didn't love me. I have a good relationship with her. Any <coughs> of You know, I have come to believe God answers all problems, but not always in the way we want it answered. Did you envy people that can drink without getting in trouble? Do I envy them? No. Oh. <laughs> 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 Pardon. Not to give you a short answer, I simply accept the fact, as we say, if you want to drink, that's your business. Oh, uh, I know I can't. 
<laughs> no, because during the period of my um, actual practicing, of course, I was married, and uh, if I worked at all, it was for my husband, and uh, he could hardly fire me, kick me out, but not fire me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and during the the uh, some two years that I drank constantly, I was I was fortunate enough I did not have to work, which I think contributed possibly to my downfall. <laughs> Mm, God love you. Be willing to accept and just work it one day at a time. Thank you all very much. Stop it.